On May 29, 1946, The Light That Failed, a film starring Ronald Coleman, was showing at the Odeon Cinema in Bristol. Three and a half minutes after the start of the 6.30 show, five shots rang out on the screen. Robert N. Parrington Jackson had been murdered. We were in a, a time when the Second World War had finished. Uh, people were starting to get back to normal. They were starting to enjoy a social life, for instance, going to the cinema, and probably felt very safe. And then suddenly there was this murder of the cinema manager, which got a lot of publicity. Uh, and uh, a lot of people were concerned over it. There was a lot of fear created by the murder. Parrington Jackson was, was an interesting character. He was uh, an ex-serviceman. Uh, He'd um, recently retired from the services. Uh, he was a cinema manager, which was, was quite a, a post at that time. So he came into to, to contact with a lot of the members of the public. When Parrington Jackson died at age 33, he had spent 17 years in show business. He returned to England to become the manager of the Odeon Cinema after failing in his attempts to become a successful actor in Hollywood. With the outbreak of World War II, Parrington left his wife and a young son to serve in the Navy. He survived the war, returning to his family and the Odeon, only to die seven weeks later, the victim of this unusual crime. 47 years after the files were closed on the unsolved murder, a man came forward claiming his late father, Billy the Fish Fisher, was guilty of the crime, the result of a failed robbery attempt. The police followed up the lead, but no evidence was found to substantiate the story. Mysterious questions remain. Why was the safe where Parrington had locked 500 pounds minutes before he died left untouched and the keys still in the dead man's pocket. Who were the two unidentified men seen lingering in the corridor moments before the shot? There were no signs of a struggle other than an overturned chair. Why did someone want Parrington dead? And what happened to the murder weapon? We know that a man was shot through the head. We believe that it was a bungled robbery. Uh, we believe that the man had relationships with other women and they may have been jealous partners, husbands, whatever. And that really is all the information we've got. Uh, there was probably about five suspects, but nobody at any time that looked like what we would class as a good suspect. It's quite possible that the murderer was seen but was allowed to leave the premises and has never been traced. There was a, a story that somebody had actually escaped through an air vent, which was in the in the, the cinema, but it was very, very tiny, and I've read the papers the, from the time. There was a statement from a man who actually worked at the cinema who looked at this and said it was impossible for a man to get through. Whether that's right or wrong, again, we shall never know, but it would appear that the murderer had actually left by the front door of the cinema. Do you understand? Don't leave me. You wouldn't leave me alone now, would you? It's black. Quite black. And I feel as if I were falling through it all. I keep very quiet for a while. This darkness will lift. It's just on the point of breaking. You feel better. I can do it now because I have it inside me. Now! I mustn't let them think we're afraid of them, must we? All the powers of 
darkness in that lot? My God, I'm blind! I'm blind and the darkness won't go away! Steady, Dick, steady. Words at the Odeon when Parents and Jackson was murdered. What she remembers of working there is his lovely place to work, apart from the fact that she had to work with him. But she also says that she remembers being caught several times chatting to other members of staff, and he would come chasing her out of the office up the stairs to make sure she went back to where she was supposed to be working. And uh, matter of fact, that's what we get caught doing to this day. When I spoke to my grandmother, she felt that the person who had murdered him was a ginger-haired Welsh front of house man. And um, to this day, she still thought it was him. Before he was killed, his wife hadn't seen him for three days previously. And he also had a flat on top of the Odeon, which he took the women back to, and where he stayed overall pretty much all the time. My grandmother told me that Parenton's wife reacted not the way everyone would have expected someone to react when they found out their husband had died. She seemed to be far too happy about it. And in fact, six months after he had died, she then married the assistant manager, Mr. Shepherd, and he adopted all of the children. I think she believed that it's because he cheated on someone one time too many and so on, came back and got his own back. a great deal till she could suffer no more that's what i want that is sorrow that is every sorrow that sorrow so deep it's it's laughter come on bessie throw your head back and laugh come on laugh bessie laugh <laughs> 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 I think it would be fair to say, though, that his contacts also brought him into, it meant he also came into contact with women, um, maybe several women, and there were suggestions around relationships. Some of it was rumour, some of it was not quite proved, but there was always this belief that there were other women in his life. We keep talking about a man, and we've been told that a man committed the murder. There is, of course, a very good possibility that it was in fact a woman. Uh, we've never been given the information that a woman was seen there, or, but it's, it's something which you can't overlook. We've not been able to say who committed the murder or how the murder was committed, other than the fact that Mr. Parenton Jackson was shot through the head. I'll never see you again. Of course you will, sometime. While I experienced the ghost before I heard about the ghost, I felt this coldness when I was working at the Odeon. And I told a colleague of mine, and he said, oh yeah, that's the ghost in Cinema 3. It got to the point where I was dreading going down into Odeon 3, because every time I went down there, something would literally hit me with a physical force, either in the head, in the hands, in the legs, and I physically couldn't stand it anymore. So I've actually lost my, my job because I couldn't work there. I had to leave. And I believe that I've been given this ability, if you like, to pick up these, these signals. There are people's um, feelings that have been wiped out in a second. And there is a fear, there is an anger, there's a, an outrage, but most of all, there's a sheer panic of the night that that murder happened. It's been frozen in time. I've actually felt the pain of the, of the wound. I, I felt the, the adrenaline rush of the person that actually fired those shots. Your turn. 
I don't want to be selfish. Maisie, are you afraid? No. The truth has not been told, not the complete truth anyway. The, the ghost haunts the Odeon because he was violated in such a uh, quick and sudden way that he wants to tell people what has happened. He wants his story, his side of the story told. <laughs>